Um, good morning. My name is Sherry Anderson, and I represent the wacky, wacky world of market research. This is street level. How do we sell cars? How do we sell bank accounts? How do we sell ad time? I'm right down in there in the mud of what uh, Joe six, six Pack, average Joe Six Pack American, is up to. But we're going to step back and take a look at a bunch of segments today, how they work together. Um, is there an innovator segment? You know, there is a status quo segment, and I'm going to talk about that because that you really have to get your arms around that to understand how things or why things diffuse or don't diffuse through innovators. But our research over 20 years in many countries does support the empirical fact that you do have a segment in most countries of innovators that have a particular kind of personality. It will feature novelty seeking as a persistent trait, not just fads coming and going, confidence, the kinds of things you guys are familiar with. And they have a general organic impulse to walk around and say, hey, the status quo sticks. How can I change it? Question mark. So that's, the, that's a, kind of a quote that captures their mindset. Um, I'm just going to move quickly through a lot of slides as I want to just give you guys a little bit of a framework. But basically, we have a global framework. It's a prototype. And so in different countries where we have actual segmentation systems and data and that kind of thing, the segments exist in different sizes, slightly modified psychologies for the culture. But the general idea is pretty consistent with what we all know about innovation. You have innovator groups, things diffuse down to more status quo groups. You have followers, rank and file members of a culture, and then you may have real laggards who just aren't with that particular flow of ideas. Um, we do see around the world that there are three innovation pathways. So there might be one innovation segment, but you've got a few different pathways. And when you get your product or service aligned with the right pathway, given what the benefit is, things go much better. If you make a mistake, which many companies do, you can really fail, okay? It's important. Um, and I want to put in a side note here. It's very easy. You can find people who are passionate about your idea, but that does not mean they are sold on the benefit. Passion and being sold on the benefit is not the same thing. Do not confuse the two if you can help it. So real quick, we could do whole dissertations in every one of these types, but you have a pathway through tradition, through ideals. People get excited about things that have stood the tradition of time, and now they're just extending that a little bit. That's one pathway, and that's kind of over here. We have a pathway of diffusion or innovation through status, being early with status symbols, getting ahead, productivity <coughs> tools, and a pathway that's all about basically excitement, stimulation, and pleasure. And if you're looking for some iconic people, you can think Mandela, Schultz, Goodall for tradition, and Robert Murdoch, if it's legal, it's moral, Martha Stewart, Larry Ellison for business, or productivity and achievement, and some of the folks for more self-expression like Lady Gaga and Dennis Rodman. I'm obviously giving you things that'll have an economy of expression in your mind so you can kind of quickly tag along. The actual statistical distributions of these personalities get way more complicated. But just so we can see, there is a framework and there are some paths here. Um, and each path has a certain kind of emphasis. And I'm going to go through some actual examples in the United States. But just so you can see here in your mind some contrast. Uh, folks that are more traditional motivated or belief motivated get real excited about ideas. They get real excited about knowledge. Things like safety in the auto industry or conservation or environmental preservation in the green movement. Things about um, that would basically bring you into being a citizen of the world, a little more societal <coughs> level interest than personal advantage. When we go over more to the achievement, we're going to see a lot of emphasis on goals and priorities and being privileged and being an exclusive member of society, anything that helps push that thrust along. Um, and over here on this, we've already talked a little bit about pleasure. Let me just point out that when you deal with psychology, um, and I can't underscore how important it is to start to see psychology as a context. People tend to think, oh, psychology operates in a context. 
And I like to challenge that and say, no, psychology is the context. When people have a certain psychology, that's how they see the world. They don't see it like someone else who isn't like them, for example. But there are, we could call them shadow sides or dark sides to all the psychologies, right? So for example, um, broadly speaking, belief-oriented people could end up uh, with real tunnel vision. They tend to get so absorbed into ideas and needing to have everything mapped out or spreadsheet out before they go that they end up in analysis paralysis and never get going. The achievement people want so much to get ahead, make an impact, boost their status, that they have a whatever it takes mentality. They might stab someone in the back. They might go for expediency over certain ideas of humanism, if you will. And over here on self-expression, you may end up with people who get really impatient. They want to go, go, go. Um, they just don't want to acknowledge failures of the past or problems of the future. So this is a long skate around the ring to say, don't ever forget, this is always with us. OK. Um, let me bring this down to the ground. So in the United States, I'll show you some technology adoption examples in a moment. But I want to show you, just so you can get a feel, certain groups, how they think about problems, right? How they kind of go about that. Now, innovators in general have a spirit where they can warm up to, you know, it's okay, fail quickly, fail often, fail early. <coughs> it's not really failure, as it might be. Like, if you're more of a status quo person, you might be more timid, you don't want to get egg on your face, especially at work. So you may not see it that way. Innovators are OK to kind of fail. So we have that to begin with. But take a look at these differences. I have kind of innovators at the bottom. An innovator inherently has a need, a self-image, where they say, it's in my power to do something differently. When they run into a hurdle, a problem in, in consumer society, or probably even in social or political society, they don't shrink away into the corner. They don't look for peer validation, you know, that kind of thing. They rise up because in their mind, there's no such thing as a mass market. They're a market of one, and it's them. That's, that's how the thinking works. So they think in their mind, hey, this problem needs a new solution, right? And solutions often reflect their personalities. Obviously, taken to the extreme, like a Steve Jobs or a Warren Buffett, something like that. On the other hand, you can have more of the achiever group, which in the United States is the manifestation of the status quo psychology achievers. They have different names around the world. You get more of a thinking like, if the problem affects me, then how can I get some relief? So we've all of a sudden gone from whole new solution, I have the power, to being pretty me first, my family first orientation. First of all, it has to affect my personal world of jobs, recreation, transportation, and I'm not looking to find a new solution, I'm looking to get some relief from this thing. And this is a big chunk of most markets around the world. So you can see the thinking is so different. And they're thinking to themselves, well, I've just had a setback, how do I recover from a, fo from a fumble? So I'll just say football. Uh, they are going to have a much harder time seeing beyond their own immediate problems. So like uh, Sharik and I were talking for a little bit, in the early days of presenting climate change to the American public, solutions were so global, or the thinking about it was very planetary, global, macroeconomic. That's not going to translate to a status quo achiever type person, way too global. Um, they're thinking, what is this going to cost me? What's the pocketbook benefit or drawback? And something like, oh, going green sounds great, but what about my job? Yeah. And right now, I should add that with many status quo groups around the world, one of the huge problems is they do put their finger out and check the weather temperature. So they certainly know on surveys they should be saying that climate change is a problem. That doesn't mean they're going to vote that way or act that way. So there's a lot of unpacking that has to go on about what's going on. In most cultures, we have a tradition group here in the United States. They're called thinkers. Um, I can't remember what they're called in Nigeria. I have to look on the list. Or in China. Tradition. Yeah, traditionals. And in China, I can't, maybe the same name. Anyways, take a look at what they'll go around. And they are very belief driven. They'll look at something they go, ah, injustice is just wrong. It's wrong on principle. They're not trying to see if it affects them. They're not necessarily trying to change it right away. But they say injustice is wrong. Um, they have a real need to right a wrong. So that's where their energy is going to go. Um, violations of codes of contact. Automakers should have safer cars. Governments should have greener policies, this kind of thing. 
Um, and you're going to see a whole lot of emphasis on a desire for corrective action at the societal level. We say that these people want a good life instead of a good society. If I'm at a conference and a really high, innovative type of ideals or tradition or thinking person is there, and they raise their hand, I say, ah, would you care to better the blue of heaven? That's kind of how they're going to see things. So even in your own thinking, as you're maybe looking at ventures or you're working with people, in your own mind, even though there is a systematic way to do this, you can sort of say, I wonder which type of bucket of person I have. And it should influence how you present your ideas and so forth. Let's see what else I have here. Oh, um, really quick some examples. Uh, so to the point about is there really an innovator segment in societies? Well, here's the United States. Carless lifestyles is a somewhat innovative idea about wanting to be able to walk most places and leave the car behind. Just take a look at this distribution. You've got 50% of people wanting that up there, and you can see the percentages really start to drop. All I'm wanting to show you here is that in data, this comes to life. This is real stuff, not just, uh, not just um, story, for example. How about autonomous cars or driverless cars? We did a project, to them, actually had some years ago, it was more recent than that. But the attitude, the idea was, it's obvious to me how a driverless car is better than a traditional car, right? Because people have to know if they're going to take on a new product, they have to be convinced of the benefit and also the competitive hurdle. Like, they have to know that this is better than what I currently have for some reason. Take a look at these numbers. Innovators at 19%. Here's your status quo group at 3%. So you see different, I mean, Again, we could do a whole report on this, but I'm just trying to show you these attitudes, these psychologies play out in data. So that's driverless cars. Let's see, the internet going all the, let's go back to fall of 2001. By the way, when you're trying to showcase diffusion, you have to back up in time, right? Because you want to show there was the predictive validity. So in the fall of 01, we had about 12% of adults reporting access to the internet from their homes. And you can see this is indexes for innovators way higher. In particular, you have a little bit of a higher number in this center route, which was the achievement productivity type innovator. And um, you can take a look at they were leaders in the home market adoption for CompuServe AOL back in the day, using technology to get ahead in business, to use virtual solutions to press the flesh and do a little business networking and so forth. Okay, moving along. Okay, um, I'll give you one example now for each pathway. And so we talked about the ideals. This is basically just tradition, which we are looking at. I'm just showing you in particular for the United States. Here's the adoption pattern. Look at these more societal level kinds of contexts. Safety is important, conserving resources, et cetera. They're always going to ask, how is this functionally superior to the existing solution? They don't really care, that, for example, that it be early with a status symbol. It doesn't have to have fun. It doesn't have to be Tesla. They want to know there's a functional point of superiority. So an example of early diffusion here was the Toyota Prius. Blew away coming in through this more traditional belief side for environmental conservation, uh, reduce emissions, that kind of stuff. The data tells the story there. So there you go on that one for Prius. Moving along here, they were talking about the pathway of achievement is another pathway. Let me put your attention here. Adoption happens, and when you're achieving, in a social context. We're talking about the intersection, even at a very high level, of approval seeking and the embrace of transformation. Things have to actually give people a boost in terms of your social status. And I'll show you a few examples here for the achievement level. Um, we have writing an online blog. In 06, we had about 1.2% of adults reported writing a blog. Look at these numbers over here. It's an early diffusion came right in through the achievement context. It's perfect. An online blog was a puzzle piece fit with a way to do business network, business networking. So you can promote your career, your business, things that are very achiever oriented. You see it right there in the data. I'm obviously showing you really clear examples because we have, I probably have 30 seconds left, Adi? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Diffusion in the context of novelty and stimulation here in the United States that has a particular run. And you can looking at downloading podcasts from the internet. Had all of its early diffusion way over on the right side. Its motivation was for stimulation. Okay. Let's see what else I can show you. 
Um, I'm going to just pass along a few points because I know part of the theme today is ecosystems. So when we're thinking about developing a whole innovation ecosystem, we want to think about um, real important, this notion of cross influence. Some types of psychology groups get information from other groups. Achiever status quo people often get their information from more of the thinker, knowledge-based kind of person. Um, we're also going to know that we have right here this kind of status quo group that lives in the middle. Um, all the reasons why that's important. Uh, they reference uh, sacrifice a little bit earlier on the issue of climate change. They are believing or seeing that many things that are presented to them are asking them to sacrifice. They're asking them to not have that achievement lifestyle. And they're like, how am I going to meet my financial goals if I can't drive to work, if I can't do all the things I'm used to doing? They are not going to take well to people changing the rules of the game without providing a, crit a solution to a critical mass of the puzzle. That's going to be real important to diffuse those ideas through to the status quo. Status quo is an elusive group. They're hiding in the middle on survey issues. They have opaque reasonings. They see little threat and little value on change itself. It is a real science and art on how to diffuse things through down to the status quo. And it's just as important to understand how they preserve the relative priorities of a society as it is to understand how innovators do innovative things. Take your eye off the status quo and you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, <clears throat> I had a few closing points. I already talked about the difference between being passionate about a thing and being sold on the benefit. This is where electric vehicles are getting stuck big time. I've done like the last two years I've been thick in EVs. And I can tell you there's that innovator experiencer group, the pathway of stimulation and novelty. They are so passionate about EVs. They can tell you everything about EVs. They are not sold on the benefit. They just are not sold on the benefit. The place where the EV makes the most sense is actually with status quo Americans because they have homes, they park every night, they have a relatively stable commute. All their lifestyle behavior is a puzzle perfect fit. They're not passionate about it. And I should also say, too, that it's quite hard for people. Let me show you how much entrenched thinking can kind of uh, create a context in the mind. People have been driving gas cars. They stop at a gas station, right? That's what they know. Even innovators know that. Now, all of a sudden, you say, hey, guess what? Every morning, you start with a fresh tank of gas, e.g. a new 300 miles or a new 200 miles. It doesn't compute yet. People are so acculturated to stopping and getting gas outside their home, the fact that you plug in and you start each morning fresh with the equivalent of a fresh tank of gas, even for, even for people at the top of the spectrum. So it's hard to break schemas, yeah? It's hard to break schemas. Um, the status quo segment, talk about them a little bit. Keep in mind, this happens a lot. Status quo customers are not just dimly lit innovators. This happens all the time. They just figure, well, they're just emerging up to become these self-actualized innovators. No, they're different people. Their role in a society is to stop change at some level when it doesn't have a critical mass of a solution. Their role is to anchor things down to the ground. Their role is to push away change until it really makes sense for many other stakeholders. Their role is to kind of give you like, OK, I somewhat agree with that, but they're not going until there's really a pocket um, they'd like to get along and would like to get along better, but you better probably have more on prosperity than you do on coexistence. And I'll just leave you with the sense that um, other segments also play a role in diffusion. Other segments that aren't status quo are innovators. For example, blue collar workers have a lot to do with how you run a 3D printer. Strivers, which are kind of a lot of the urban street kinds of people you see hanging around. They were part of the early commercial market for GPS, et cetera. So it, it does take a whole ecosystem, as you guys said. And here are some pictures of different uh, segmentation systems around the world. This is basically the global prototype taking the specific form of a particular culture, size of segments, and stuff like that. And I think that's my 10 minutes. OK, well, that's a lot. But <laughs> 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 <laughs>